Stock markets are down sharply on Tuesday, with the S&P declining about 1.5%. The Nasdaq down 2% ahead of a busy earnings week for tech. Leading the charge downward is First Republic Bank, down 40% on the day. Danielle DiMartino Booth is here to break down what's happening with uh, the economy and stock markets. She is the CEO of QI Research. Welcome to my show. Welcome back. Thank you for having me back. It's good to be here. So, Danielle, uh, we have to start by talking about First Republic Bank. Their shares fell 40% on Tuesday as their earnings report showed a 40.8% decline in their deposits in Q1. And this, of course, has rekindled fears in the uh, banking sector. What is next for the banking sector? You know, uh, we're in a wait and see mode here. You know, the, the funny thing, or maybe the not, not so funny thing, if you're if you're the, the the Hollywood, Florida police pension fund that's started the first class action suit against First Republic and KPMG, its auditors, which signed off on, on the company shortly before uh, Silicon Valley failed. But I think we're learning something with this First Republic chapter in this banking crisis, this ongoing uh, bank run, bank walk, bank power walk, however you want to characterize it. And that's that it's not just how many uh, how many treasuries you've got, how many how many mortgage backed securities you've got that the Fed will accept and give you 100 cents on the dollar for at its new facility. It also depends on what your loan book looks like. And in the case of First Republic, I believe it had nearly 60 billion dollars in interest only mortgages on very high-end homes, good credit borrowers, by the way, but these are these are mortgages that that you only pay interest on for the first five, seven, 10 year period. And then the interest rate pops up to whatever the prevailing interest rate is, along with uh, the principal payments, they balloon and and come due. And in a lot of these cases, whether it's Napa Valley or the Hamptons, the homes aren't worth what they were when they sold it top, top, top dollar. Right. And so do you think um, we were talking about this uh, a month ago and since a month ago, banking fears have kind of subsided for a week. Now with today's news, it looks like it's back. So I have to ask you the same question everyone was asking you a month ago. What's next for the banking crisis, uh, this banking sector? Contagion? Well, I I think what we're going to see and today was a real tug of war. We came into the day with about a 90 percent probability that the the Fed was going to hike. quarter percentage point on uh, Wednesday, May May the 3rd. And we went out of the day closer to 70%. Uh, I know that Chair Powell would prefer that it be north of that 75% probability. The reason I'm giving you such a long and drawn out answer is because it's going to make a difference come next Wednesday. If if high net worth individuals, if people with lots of deposits uh, that are sitting in banks see, he, look, I can get a five, five handle on that money market fund, you're going to have a continued run, slow run on these banks as depositors move their money into higher yielding uh, funds. And that's gonna continue to put slow but steady pressure on banks, especially banks that have loan books that cannot be acquired. Well, the 10 year yield is down sharply today. That's partly driven up the dollar. And actually, I was reading a news coming out of last night. Bloomberg was reporting that uh, hedge funds are aggressively shorting the 10 year yield. In fact, uh, according to uh, CFTC data, it, this is the biggest short in, on record. Uh, what, what's on their mind, you think? Actually, you know, if, if they're short the 10 year, then they're anticipating uh, that the price is going to fall and that the yield is going to rise. So if anything, you know, if if you were on the wrong side of that trade today and you have another little banking scare come about, uh, then you're gonna get short squeezed. And when you get short squeezed, the price is gonna rise, the yield is gonna fall. And that's what happens oftentimes, David, when we see that there's a quote quote unquote crowded trade, when when there's too much positioning on one side uh, of any given trade. Yeah, uh, Danielle, we spoke uh, a month ago and you were telling me that perhaps the Federal Reserve is nearing its end of the, uh, 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 near the end of its rate hike cycle. Do you still hold that view ahead of next week's meeting? Well, I, I, I do and I don't. I, again, uh, the Federal Reserve right now is in blackout. So they're not able to speak uh, to any members of, of the press uh, short of leaking information that they're going to step back from one more rate hike next week. I don't really see how they telegraph the fact that the markets are now trying to strong arm the Fed into not hiking. 
that's exactly what something like uh, a scare at First Republic will get you. Uh, but we'll have to wait and see, David, if we don't see something come out in a major news publication uh, to to set the market straight again, if you will. It was clearly the intention of Chair Powell and the Hawks on the committee going into blackout last Friday that there would indeed be at least one more rate hike on May 3rd, if not, according to one of his chief lieutenants, Christopher Waller, a subsequent one in uh, when they meet again in June. So uh, would you say that status quo, barring any surprise negative announcements this week, would be one more rate hike, 25 basis points next week? Certainly the CME Fed Watch tool seems to think that 70 percent of 25 basis points next week. Yeah, I think as long as it can stay up there and, and preferably over that 75 percent mark, believe it or not, Fed officials are pretty quantitative when it comes to rate hikes. They view anything north of 75% as not surprising the markets and anything south of 75% on the probability scale as potentially coming as a surprise to the market. But you know what, David? It's really a catch-22 situation here because if they if they don't hike rates uh, next Wednesday, they might also be validating the, uh, investors' citizens of the United States fears that we're actually already in recession. Whereas if they do show confidence that they can hike, then they'll be saying, you know what, inflation is still the primary problem here, not growth. Well, certainly growth could be a problem. Let's talk about that. And I think you were, you know, you were tweeting about growth as well. Uh, Let's take a look at your GDP expectations. So this week, Uh, advanced Q1 GDP numbers come out. What are your expectations? So I'm going to fall back on the individual who invented the GDP model. That's Ben Herzon. He's at S&P Global. Um, There were some pretty dramatic uh, revisions to core retail sales that came out on Monday afternoon. And that took his uh, Q1 GDP estimate to 0.9%. So barely 1%. That's his expectation for this first look-see. And that wouldn't surprise me given that so many sources of fiscal stimulus have disappeared in the face of, again, a broadening out in the layoff cycle. The Atlanta Fed GDP Now uh, tracker uh, is still estimating a positive quarter. Now that's been we're we're going to get another revision tomorrow uh, on Wednesday. We're speaking today on Tuesday, uh, but for now they, they they're projecting a positive quarter. Are they missing something, Danielle? Well, again, I, I'm going to go back to those revisions to January and February's retail sales. It is it is very difficult for broad economic gauges to capture turning points, to capture inflection points in the economy, and it's oftentimes not until we see the second or third print of something as broad as as GDP that we actually get the fully reflected data. Again, on Monday, we had January and February revisions. That means that it'll be some time now before we get revisions to March retail sales, which could easily take that number into the red. I know that there are several economic indicators that may point to a slowdown in the economy, but there are still a few indicators that may point to the opposite. And uh, I'd like to get your take on the PMI reading. So the S&P Global uh, report that I'm reading right now, it says that uh, the headline S&P Global Flash US PMI Composite Index rose to an 11-month high in April, up from 52.3 in March to 53.5. This suggests that uh, output in the US is accelerating, not decelerating. How would you interpret this data? Well, it's interesting you bring up um, the PMIs specifically because we wrote about that in today's Daily Feather. And the thing about the PMI is that it excludes construction, it excludes uh, retail, it excludes wholesale, it excludes the cyclical parts of the economy that tend to provide, hey, here's a flashing light, we're turning here, we're inflecting in the cycle. When you look at indicators such as uh, today, for example, the Philadelphia Fed, the Richmond Fed, and the Dallas Fed came out with their services, not their manufacturing, their services surveys. I don't think we've seen data as weak as we have, especially forward looking in the history of any of these series. So uh, you've been tweeting about inflation and the relationship between inflation and the money supply. Mm-hmm. I think there's been some confusion in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the in the public sphere. You're around being very polite, what, David, but yes. <laughs> yeah, confusion, misunderstanding around what the money stock actually does. Can you, can you shed some light as to the relationship between the money supply, money flow? and the CPI. 
So uh, way back in the day when I was working at the Federal Reserve, uh, there were a lot of us arguing inside the Fed that the economy was strong enough after QE1 uh, for the Fed to pull back and not launch QE2 and subsequent to that QE3. But Ben Bernanke was so fearful of what would happen if the flow of liquidity into the economy was to stop what would happen so people love to put up on twitter here's look at m2 well they're showing you the stock of money but they're not showing you the direction that that money is moving in and with today's release we were seeing that m2 monetary aggregate and m2 is actually declining by 4.03 percent year over year you have to go back to the early 1930s when the great depression was setting in uh to see numbers at this degree of contraction. And that is what markets do not like, especially as we're seeing other central banks around the world also uh, not being uh, not being liquidity providers anymore, as well as Janet Yellen running down the nation's checking account to the extent uh, that she has until she just finally got in some tax receipts. But this is a reflection of how much liquidity is coming out of the system, and it is not market friendly. If you plot the annual percent change of the M2 money stock, so you get you, you get you get a percent change. And if you plot that number, that series over the CPI change, otherwise known as the inflation rate, there's a pretty close correlation going back to history. Are you does that imply then that inflation will continue coming down now that we have a four percent decline in M2? It does indeed. In fact, I've been running a chart of that uh, uh, on Twitter going back to 1875. And the relationship is extremely tight. And all signals right now are suggesting, especially especially when you wake up to great big layoff announcements, uh, there, there's nothing more than not having an income at all, not having a paycheck at all. There's nothing more deflationary than that. And, and I think that that's what we have indeed been seeing. If you look at backlogs, for example, unfilled orders, there really are collapsing across the board. And that's a signal that looking out over the, over the horizon, six to 12 months out, we're not gonna need labor to fill orders we don't have. So, uh, no, I think there are definitely deflationary winds blowing, and that's very very much so reflected in, in M2 contracting at the rate at which it is. All right. So let's finish off on markets and your investment implications. Now, certainly, like I said, huge market decline today in stocks. Uh, certainly, investors are projecting or anticipating a weak earnings season. Is that something you're anticipating as well? So uh, right now, we're looking for S&P earnings to drop at about a 6% rate. This is going to be our second quarter. So back-to-back -back quarters of earnings recession. I'll just take you back, if you will, to um, to the Great Recession. That was when the sell side analyst community took their earnings estimates down six quarters in a row, and that's really one of the best uh, parallels that we can draw with where we are today, given the fact that we appear to have a very slow but but steady financial crisis brewing in the background. And um, and how are you positioned then? Or how should investors be positioned in light of everything we discussed, perhaps weakening earnings, perhaps lower inflation, and perhaps uh, weakening GDP numbers coming out? So uh, my stance has not changed. In fact, um, I'm, I'm very pleased with some headlines that have come across, the, the, come across the past few days. We really haven't seen defaults in municipalities. Well, you know what? There are a lot of really well-run municipalities. There are a lot of poorly run ones as well, straight due north of me. I'm in Texas, so just go all the way north until you hit the Canadian border and then stop. Um, but 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 there are some well-run municipalities, well-run states. Gold is going to be just fine in these circumstances, as is, gee, I can get just about 5% in my money market fund, step to the sidelines, actually collect a nice income flow, and watch everybody else not sleep at night. Right. Would you, would you actually go for a if you were to choose between, let's say, uh, fixed income, money market fund, or uh, maybe a high-grade corporate uh, bond uh, versus a dividend collecting stock, what would what would it be? Well, in times like these, when the price to earnings ratio using the Cape Schiller uh, price to earnings ratio, when the Cape when the Cape Schiller price to earnings ratio is closer to thirty than it is to twenty, and that that's about six times what it was in 1920, kind of at its cheapest. Uh, at times like these, good companies become the baby that's thrown out with the bathwater. 
And so despite the fact that you've got a good dividend stream coming off a stock, a lot of times you can end up losing more in capital depreciation, what you lose on that stock price, than you're getting on that dividend stream, especially when cash is yielding as much as it is. Yeah, and finally, uh, same logic with real estate. Some people are looking into real estate as a source of fixed income, uh, leasing the property out. Does the same logic apply that you're worried about a capital depreciation in a house and that could wipe out your uh, fixed income gains? Oh, absolutely. We, we've heard so much in the past few months about the fact that Americans may still be vacationing, but there are so many Airbnb and VRBOs to choose from, so many investors who've piled in looking for this in inflation hedging cash flow stream that supply is simply overwhelming demand. And now we're starting to hear about vacancies. There are so many vacant homes, dark homes in all of these markets. So I, I think that when supply overwhelms demand, that you step back and wait for a better entry point. All right, Danielle, fantastic. Thank you for your insights. And where can we follow your work? So please come to demartinobooth.substack.com. Love to have you as a QI Research uh, client. And you have your Twitter as well, where you're very active. Uh, yes. Uh, often uh, yes. educating the public, if I may put yes. very politely. Uh, I uh, Today, I have, uh, today I've tried to be as polite as humanly possible. Somebody <laughs> actually put, put up a chart of a stock versus a flow on two different uh, on two different uh, scales. And I tried my very best to be polite, but yes, most of the time it is a great place to get a very cheap MBA. <laughs> All right. I'll put a link in the Twitter, uh, in the description for your Twitter as well. Thank you again for your time. Appreciate it. Speaking again next time. Thank you. And thank you for watching my show. Don't forget to subscribe.